Welcome everyone. Today's topic is real estate probates. Um, we have Sharon Bornhold from Kentucky. She is the master, the queen of probate. So it's an honor to have you with us tonight. Thank you for joining, Sharon. Um, so the floor is yours. Uh, I can, we can make you the presenter so that you can share your screen. Okay. Okay, so you're gonna become the presenter. Okay. Okay. Okay, so you can see the slides up there, okay? Yes, we can see it, Sharon. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we see them. Okay, well, I'm always happy to be back here. So as Hugo said, I'm Sharon Bornholt. And I've been doing probates for uh, quite a long time now, about 13 years of the 23 that I've been investing. And they continue to be what I consider to be the number one source of leads. Um, so I always say, you know, here's what we're gonna cover tonight. Why you should invest in probates and why now is a once in a lifetime opportunity. We're going to talk about your mindset and the mindset of those folks in probate. The process, just gonna touch on a little bit of the terminology, marketing, and then um, probate investing simplified. So we're going to just go through this uh, a little bit uh, quickly tonight. I'm going to try to collapse this panel on the side. There we go, because it's over the top of my slides. So the number one challenge for investors has always been lack of consistent leads. They would have leads for a while, then not have leads for a while. Um, this particular time has been particularly challenging since COVID-19. But with probates, you never have to worry about where your leads are going to come from because sadly, there's always going to be leads. So if you're looking for a consistent lead source to add to the, the sources that you're already using, and just to be clear, you should have three to five ways to get leads at all times. But probates in my book, um, because they'll always be there, should definitely be on your, on your list. Now, you know that off-market deals are deals that are not on the MLS, and they're often sourced locally, which makes them unique in that um, for those of us that don't have a service like Ch a Chicago Deal Vault, they're a little bit harder to find, but that also makes them much more desirable. And what I like about these especially is that you get to deal directly with the, uh, the people. The, uh, you don't have to deal with an agent. You get to talk to the family. You get to deal with the executor or personal representative. That puts you in a unique position when it comes to standing out in the marketplace. If you stop and think about this just a little bit, on the MLS, there's no human interaction. You make your deal and it's almost always based on numbers and possibly terms, but the people behind the, behind the scenes, they never get to uh, be seen by the seller. So that's a huge advantage when it comes to probates. But uh, as you know, there's a lot less competition for off-market deals. You don't have every agent and investor on the MLS looking for deals. This is definitely a unique time in history because there's been such a backlog of probates. In my area, we're coming up on seven to eight months now. What happened was, um, you know, if you, if you understand the probate process, it takes people a while to, to get ready to open the estate and move forward. Now, some of those people had filed the probate. They had started the process in court when the court suddenly closed down. Then there were the other people that never got to file that had had someone that had passed away maybe as much as six months, nine months, or a year before all of this started. So you have this backlog of cases in almost every area. Now, your area seems to be a little bit more open than my area. And I talked to an investor today who's across the country. 
and he said his courts are open on a very limited basis. So they're stacking up in a lot of areas. You also need to know that in, by and large, these have nothing to do with COVID-19. So these were people that passed away before COVID started. There's no doubt at this point in time, some people in there that you know do have COVID, but there will always be probate leads, as I said, but you've never seen a situation like this. I've never seen a situation like this since 1998. You don't need to be worried that this is a bad time to buy. Now, what I mean by that is, let's say, for instance, you're a rehabber. If you're worried about uh, having to hold your rehab too long, which hasn't been a problem, but I do have some people in my sphere that they're worried that it's a, it's a bad time to buy a house to rehab it, that you might get stuck with it if the market turns. There will always be people there to buy your deals if they're a good deal. They'll still be landlords. So you can always wholesale the deal. And people say to me all the time, I don't think I can do this. I don't think I can talk to these people. Well, we're going to cover that. And yes, you really can do this. It is possible for anyone to work in the niche of probates. I love them because they're off market. They're very lucrative. These are some of the most lucrative deals over all the years I've been in real estate that I've done because the people in general, they don't want the property. They just want to be rid of the problem. They want the cash that's in the property. They don't want to have to deal with all of the things that are coming up in the property, like utilities, like, um, you know, keeping up the maintenance on the house. They just don't want to do that. Since you'll never run out of leads, what you have to focus on is that they have a problem and you can solve it. And that problem is they have a house that they must sell as part of the probate process. They just don't want the house. They want the cash sitting in the house and they want the problem to go away. So let's look at the steps in the probate process. This graphic uh, lays out how the process works. Now, understand that there are a lot of things going on behind the scenes. The attorneys are taking care of things, they're filing paperwork and these sorts of things. But this is the, the, at the very basic level, what you need to know and understand about probates. Someone passes away and at some point in the future, the probate is filed. The estate is opened. Now, as I said, that could be two or three months after the person uh, passed away. But in general, it's been my experience that it's, it's quite a bit of time passes, maybe six months, nine months, maybe close to a year. So there is a gap there uh, for obvious reasons. People need to be ready to uh, deal with all the things other than the passing of this person. So at some point, the probate is filed. Now, the, the next thing that happens depends on whether or not there's a will. If there is a will, then the estate is called testate, and it will be a process whereby the judge approves the will and makes sure it's a valid will, and they will also um, note in the will who is the executor. The executor is the person chosen by the deceased to carry out their wishes and the disposition of their assets. In the absence of a will, that's called intestate, then it's a similar process in that the, there will be someone appointed to carry out the duties. Uh, the duties and responsibilities are exactly the same, whether it's an executor or an administrator but they will uh, choose someone to carry this out. Now, it's not just any one random person. There is an, um, a hierarchy of how they do this, and that's determined by the laws of the state. For instance, if, um, if a, a, let's say someone passed away and their spouse had uh, was deceased before them, then the next likely person, the next person in line would be a child and so forth. It goes down the line, whatever the uh, hierarchy is um, for your particular state. Now, once this happens, and this is the, the thing that is so important, 
the assets are sold. And this is the time when you can buy the property. So if you look at this process, as you, there are several steps after this that have to, that will happen after the assets are sold. But the assets are everything in the estate, you know, personal property, real property, things that were not directly willed. So this, this includes any real estate. The assets are sold so that the creditors can be paid. Now, who are the creditors? Well, they're obviously anybody that would have a mortgage on the house. It could be a, a private lender, it could be a reverse mortgage, or it could be a home equity line. It could be someone like that. It would be anyone that uh, a bill is owed to. Uh, card payments, it could be credit cards. It would certainly be things like hospital bills, nursing home bills, and funeral expenses. Now, I want you to look what comes next. This is the point at which the heirs inherit whatever is uh, being left to them. So if you look down that list and that timeline, there is quite a bit of time passes before they get what they're supposed to inherit. Once that happens, then the estate is closed. So the, the point at which you can buy the house is roughly in about the middle of the process. If you come upon a, an estate and it's already closed, you're too late. So just, just this is really important and I want you to get it. This is when you can buy the house, kind of in the middle. So let's talk about mindset. I've come to find out that there are four main reasons that investors as a whole avoid working in the niche of probates. And the first one is by and large, they don't understand the process themselves. They think that it's very legal, it's very technical, they don't know where to start. But as you can see from the diagram before, it's really a very straightforward process. So that's number one. Number two is they don't know how to find the leads. Now that's not a problem for you all because you have Chicago Deal Vault. But let me tell you in every other area, it is a huge problem. They simply do not know where to start. And even once when they figure it out, it's not always that easy to get the leads. So assuming that they get the leads, the next roadblock that they come upon is they don't understand how to market to these folks without offending them. Now, I want to be clear about this. This is not a time to call these people up. These people have lost someone near and dear to them. They don't want a phone call. They don't want you to knock on the door and they don't want you to do the things that you might do for a FISBO, a for sale by owner house. This is a completely different um, way that you have to do this in order to be successful. Yes, you can call them, but you won't be getting, you won't be getting deals. The biggest reason that uh, investors really shy away from, from doing probates at all is their own mindset. They think it's weird. They don't know how to, they, they don't think they know how to talk to these sellers. They think that they've got to just jump in and address the whole thing about someone passing away. Or they just plain think it's creepy. But we have to go back to the problem. These folks have a problem. So someone has passed away, but they have to take care of the business of settling the estate. We're not, I'm not a tax person and I'm not going to get into any of that type of stuff, but just know that there has to be a, a tax return filed on this estate, not just the person uh, that has passed, but on the estate itself. So they are legally obligated to continue with this process. They need to sell the property. And like I said, they don't want to fool with it. They don't want to pay those heating bills in Chicago when it's zero. They don't want to cut the grass in the summer. They don't want to do all the repairs. So they they are very motivated to take care of this, uh, the settling of the estate. And they're going to have to deal with, uh, you know, taking care of all the deceased belongings too. So what we are able to do 
in working with probates is provide these people with a solution to a problem that they desperately want off their plate. And it's not any different than any other deal uh, from where I live, from where you folks are in, in the Chicagoland area. It is just another deal. You've got to get your mindset right. You've got to learn the process and you need to learn the right way to market to these people. And it's easy to be successful in this uh, niche of probates. So let's talk about the mindset of the sellers for a minute. Now you can imagine that they're they're upset naturally, but at the at the end of the day, they're just people like us. They want to move forward with this whole process, but they put it off for a number of reasons. One is their mindset. Another one is they're confused about the process. If they have a probate attorney, the probate attorney is likely telling them, don't worry about it, I'll let you know what comes next. But some folks try to do this on their own and it generally turns out to, to be a problem because they'll do something out of order. So they're dealing with their own mindset in this terrible thing that has happened. They're confused about the process. They have a house that needs a ton of repairs and updates and they just get to this point where they are just stuck. It's like they just can't move forward. But the number one reason they haven't sold, and I have found this to be true over more than a decade of working in this niche, is that there's so much stuff in the house. They go to the house and they'll look for valuables, they'll look for things that are important to them, mementos, pictures, uh, certainly most families, they search for money and valuables and things like that. They'll, they'll take those things and then they look around and there's all this stuff. They've got oftentimes collections of things that, that these people have kept like butter tubs, uh, Tupperware dishes, old magazines. So they have all of that kind of stuff. But the other thing that they see is their their moms or their dads or their loved ones personal belongings that they loved so much and the guilt of getting rid of this stuff you know you have to realize it often doesn't have any monetary value yes it was it was their favorite china cabinet but it's really old and it's not an antique there just simply is no monetary value but they have to get rid of it so there's a huge amount of guilt. Uh, if you've ever done this process, you know that it's gut-wrenching to get rid of your mom's, your dad's things that they love so much, but they are possibly not even something that you could donate. So when an investor shows up and they say to them, I can help you with the sale of this house, I can clean out the house for you, then you've got a winner on your hands. You know, you, you are first of all, one of only of a handful of investors that has shown up and followed this process through. They're looking for a quick hassle-free solution. And just the fact that you've made it this far means that you are already a standout. But at the end of the day, it comes back to this every single time. And this is true uh, across all real estate niches. We are at the core problem solvers, and we just happen to deal in problems that involve houses. Now, people, they perceive that they have a lot of competition, when in reality, you really don't have that much competition. There are a lot of people that start uh, with probates as they do with other niches. They start, but they never really, they never really go full circle. So this is your competition there. Your competition is gonna get in there and do a little bit and then they're going to find out, yes, this is work. This is actually work. You have to do marketing and you have to talk to people. You have to have those conversations until you learn how to do them, which are going to seem uncomfortable to you, which really and truly are not uncomfortable. But just know this, that your perceived competition is way less than what you think that it is. Like I said, the number one reason though that you should choose probates is you will never run out of leads. And with Chicago Deal Vault, 
you do not have uh, uh, it's not hard to get leads it's literally a push of a button so I, I really want y'all to understand what uh, a gift you have with that what I would give to have Chicago deal vault in my area now when it comes down to the types of properties you find in probates they generally fall into three categories but what I have found over time is that these houses oftentimes they don't need the big things you know people have put in a new roof or new energy efficient windows they maybe have done other big things like bought a high uh, energy efficient furnace but they have not updated the property since 1973. Now that's not in every case, but that's in a lot of the houses. These folks take pride in their homes. They don't care about the decorating. They don't care that the cabinets are really old, but they care that they're warm and that their roof doesn't leak. So these houses might be really nice houses. These are generally not going to be sold to investors. Although I'll circle back to that in a minute, there are some times that they are sold to investors. These houses will generally be listed on the MLS. The, the next category, I call them the dogs. Those are the ones that are obviously choices for investors. They're the ones that need a ton of repairs and upgrades, and those are the properties that we're always looking for. Then there are the maybes. And when I say that pro, the probates are totally unaffected by the market, that is true. People will always pass away. It doesn't depend on the economy. It doesn't depend on elections. It doesn't depend, it's not affected by any of that. But you get these houses and I like to call them the maybes. So in a seller's market, these are the houses that could really go either way. They need, they need repairs. They're not in horrible, horrible shape, but they still need a significant amount of repairs. If you are in a seller's market, then they're most likely going to be listed on the MLS because the inventory is in such short supply. In a, in a buyer's market, boy, that's a whole different ball game. Those properties are going to be, um, so they're going to be sold to investors. I bought a ton of properties that needed very minimal work back in 2008, 9, 10, around that time period. Those are the only houses that are, will be affected by the market, and they're only affected in that it depends on whether it's a seller's market or a buyer's market. They're not affected by the stock market, by pandemics. They're not affected by any other type of world events and you could have a war and there would still be probates now i said i was going to circle back to nice houses and the the situation where you can buy a nice house and have it be sold to an investor for a significant discount that is when uh, you're in a situation that involves time and circumstances for instance, if you have a seller on the West Coast, let's say they're in California, and they have uh, an estate they need to settle that's in Chicago, it may just simply be too much trouble for them to travel back and forth to do all the things to clean up the house. When you can offer them a hassle-free solution, I'll take care of it all for you. Just you tell me what you need and I will do it all. You can then, add, for those houses, you can get some really drop dead good deals. Now, people worry all the time about the legal aspects of probate. So, what does this actually, when you get right down to it, what does it have to do with your business? How does it affect you being able to work in probates? Well, it has absolutely no effect because you do not need to be an attorney. You do not need to understand a bunch of legal stuff. You do need to understand some basics of how the, ter of how the process works, of the terminology, and of how to talk to sellers. But your attorney, and I like to say this is why God made attorneys, they will, they will know if there's a problem. When you send a contract over to your real estate attorney, assuming you close with attorneys, uh, 
here we close with attorneys and even then if you close with a title company the attorney there is they're going to find out if there's a problem with the estate you don't have to to worry about that because when they run the title it's going to come up so all you need to know is some basics and you need to be sure that there's someone there on your team now my real estate attorney my closing attorney is uh, the, one of the key members of my team once you have a basic understanding of the uh, of how probate works you'll be able to show up as an expert every single time and what that does to the seller is it shows that the seller that you know more than the average guy and trust me on this it's not that hard to be the standout just remember that the house needs to be sold to close the estate now there are times when people set up trusts and things like that and they don't go through probate but you buy the house before the estate is closed. So let's just talk a little bit about um, the terminology in probate because you have to be able to talk to these people and you have to understand what it is you're doing. So probate is the legal process of administering a will which is overseen by the probate court. Matters concerning wills and estates are handled by the probate court. This would include money, property, and any other assets in the estate. Now that is a very, I don't know if you would say legal definition, but that is the definition of what is probate. probate. So it's the process of administering a will or the estate in the absence of a will. Now there's some terms that you're going to come across and you, you just need to understand what these mean in case they come up in a conversation. We've talked about testate and intestate. Testate is when there is a will and intestate is when there's no will. We talked about the executor and the administrator. So the executor is named in the will, the administrator is appointed by the court, and they are jointly referred to as the personal representative. So you will hear this all the time where they refer to that, uh, the person in charge. That's the decision maker, the executor or the administrator. They are the decision maker and they are the person that can sign on the dotted line on a sales and purchase contract. Now you'll also hear people refer to the letters. Now think back to when I said they opened up the, the probate and they decide who's in charge, who's the decision maker, is there a will, is there no will. Once that is sorted out, they, they issue uh, a certificate and they say who has the authority to take care of the assets in the estate, who has the authority to sell the assets in the estate. And those are called the letters of testamentary. They're most commonly referred to as the letters. So if someone says, I have a copy of the letters, what they're showing you is proof of the actual person that you should be signing a real estate contract with. So just, just you don't have to know anything else about it except it's issued by the court based on whether or not there's a will and it says who can sell the property legally. Now in an estate, you're going to have two kinds of property. You're going to have real property and personal property. Of course, you know, real property is real estate and land. It's anything attached to the land like uh, oil or gas or mineral rights, ponds, things like that, uh, driveways that, you know, that is runs across the land. All these things are part of real property. Personal property in general is classified as things that can be moved. So jewelry, stocks, bonds, cars, antiques, all those sorts of things. Um, all those are personal property. Now, a couple of other terms, the decedent, I'm sure you all know this one, that's the person that's passed away. The estate is everything that that individual owned. So that's personal property, that's real property. And all of these are managed by the personal representative and they are, the, the laws of your state lay out how these things have to uh, be disposed of. 
and every state is a little bit different in some respects. The heir is the person who is going to inherit, and in many cases, there are multiple heirs. Now, I got a question today, and we'll talk about this in marketing, but they were, uh, the question was, should I be marketing to all the heirs and the personal representatives? My answer is that I've tried it both ways, and I, I found that you don't need to do that. And here's the reason why. It's because whoever is the legal decision maker, if they are not the one that's going to be showing the house, um, you know how the dynamics are in families. Somebody's in charge, and it may not be the person who was in the will that was designed, that was designated to be the the executor. Maybe it's the bossy sister or the or the stable uh, brother, the one that cons is considered to be the smart guy. They're, all families have these dynamics. So there's every chance that you will be dealing with someone who is not actually the personal representative, and that's okay. Just know that they can't sign the contract. Yeah, remember, when you can buy the house, you, you, you've got that one down pat. You can buy it um, when it's time to sell the assets. So if you look back over the steps, you'll see that this is really a pretty straightforward process. It, it follows right down a path. And once you understand the steps, if you go back to one of the reasons I said that people hesitate to work in probates is because they don't understand the process. This is the process. It's not hard. It's not complicated. You just have to know the process. So let's talk about getting getting the leads. And what information do you need to work in probates? Well, you just need four pieces of information. The name and address of the deceased and the personal representative, that's it. You don't need case numbers. You don't need to know when the person passed away because when they open the estate, that's your signal, that's the sign that they are ready to move forward with settling the estate. Now, in, in the US, there are over 3,300 counties, so there is no one place for people across the country to get leads. If in the absence of Chicago Deal Vault, you can get them online. They're published in the newspaper, well, online in some places. Let me back up there. They're not online in my area, and they're not online in many areas. You may get them the, out of the newspaper. They're in the newspaper here. They might be online um, like in a different way. So you can't Google probates where I live, but you can go in and you can look at wills. You can look at other, uh, there are other ways to get some of the information. It might be in legal publications. There are still a lot of places that have to go to the courthouse and pull those leads. It's unbelievable to me that uh, one of the states is New Jersey. These folks have to actually physically go to the courthouse and pull those cases. And there are purchase leads, and I'm not a fan. They're very expensive. Sometimes they're $10 a lead. They're not always accurate. They often don't have all of the in, those four pieces of information that you need. So, we're back to the same old thing. You have a, a very valuable resource in that you can go into Chicago Deal Vault and you can just pull those leads and begin your marketing campaign and you literally could get started tomorrow. So once you have your leads, what do you do? Well, you're going to have to market to these folks. And once you find a house and you put it under contract, I send the A to P B contract where I'm buying the house immediately over to my attorney. Now, I want to know if there is a problem with the, with the title. Have they skipped any steps? You know, I had a closing one time that took a very long time because the family was trying to do it and they just really messed the whole thing up. So they had to go back to the beginning and start over. So now I just, as soon as I get a house under contract, if it's a probate, assuming that you know, in general I would be wholesaling the house. So I wanna know right away, is there a problem with this? Is there any problem with the estate? Now, 
I will go ahead and call my uh, a buyer uh, from my buyer's list. You don't need to wait on that because for a wholesaler, their buyer's always going to be another investor. So you can tell another investor, send the contract over, uh, we'll go ahead and if you want the house, we'll put it, the house under contract. And if there should be a problem that arises, another investor, if you go back to them and say, look, it's going to be a month or two longer, they're going to say, okay. But the main, the main takeaway from here is uh, if you are a wholesaler, send the, the A to B contract, the one where you're buying the house, over to the closing company right away. Don't hang on to it and wait till you find a buyer. These, in most areas, like I said, are just like any other deal. Now, when it comes to marketing, these this is a very different uh, way you need to market to these people. You need to be mindful that these people have lost someone. So once you've got your list, you want to send a direct mail letter to them every month. You don't want any hard sells in there, no urgents, no capital letters, no, you know, you want your letter to be very low key. And you want it to give the overriding feeling of, I'll be here when you're ready to sell. Okay, no, let's hurry up and I'll put your house under contract. This is not the time for that. It's not the time for anything other than being mindful of the emotional aspect of what these people are going through. So be patient. Nurture your leads. Send them a direct mail letter every month, not every six weeks, not for eight touches. You mail to these folks until you buy the house, someone else buys the house, or they come off your list for some reason. So I always get this question, what would be a, uh, one of those reasons? But well, probates have to be sold for cash. You cannot do creative finance because remember the assets have to be liquidated. Everything has to be turned into cash. So if you were to come up on a house that was 100% financed, there wouldn't be a way to um, unless you just want to pay 100% of the price and you could find that somebody that would finance that, there's really nothing you can do with that sort of, that type of a deal. And then go back to your list every four to six months at least. Uh, would be better if you did it quarterly, but it's been my experience that's, that generally doesn't happen. So scrub your list every four to six months and take, take off houses that have sold. So that's the process. Get your list, mail to them every month, mail to everybody every month, adding new probates every month. So you've got all of your ones to date, and then when the, the next month comes up, you add those to your list. So your list is continually building, but you are continually scrubbing your list so that you're taking off the houses that have sold. I hope that makes sense. Now, understand that 81% of your deals will come at or beyond your fifth mailing. Does that mean that you will not get a deal on the first four letters? No, absolutely not. I've gotten deals from the first mailing. But statistically, across all different types of real estate, 81% of your deals will come at or beyond your fifth mailing. The other thing that you need to know though, is that 90% of the people, your perceived competition, will stop mailing on or before the third mailing. Do you see where the, the that gap comes here? So they're all in for about three ma mailings. Then when they haven't made um, $100,000, $200,000 in three months, they're out. This is too much like work. So don't get discouraged, just keep mailing. And what happens is you start to build momentum. The, the momentum builds and then you've got people getting your fifth mailing, you've got people getting your fourth mailing, you've got people getting your third mailing and so on. So you will, you will gain tremendous momentum over time. So you don't want to stop mailing and you mail to these folks until you buy the house, someone else buys the house or they come off your list, right? Now, we covered this, but if you think back to what I said, you start mailing to probates as soon as the uh, estate is opened. 
they're they're giving you a sign that they're ready to move forward with the sale of the house so i hope this makes sense to you because if you mess any part of this up if you kind of mail to them every so often or you stop and start you will not get results good results with direct mail i've actually been doing direct mail for more than 30 years through two businesses so i can tell you this for sure consistency wins every single time so i would encourage you to do this you have a wonderful resource for pulling probate leads and other off-market deals and you should definitely add those to your business and when it comes to probates i, I would encourage you to look down the road six months 12 months 24 months from now if you don't add probates to your business this never-ending stream of leads if you don't do that today where will your business be in two years from now 18 months from now will you still be struggling to get a consistent source of leads well i think the answer is yes because there is no other way to get uh, a consistent flow of leads where you will never run out of leads like there is with probates there just isn't and as I said before this is really a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity with all this uh, backlog of cases that are just coming out of the system some have the floodgates have opened in some areas in most areas that still hasn't happened yet but this will give you the ability to cherry pick deals. There, there really could not be a better situation for probates. Now, I know that there are some letters. Um, Hugo's got some letters in Chicago Deal Vault. If you want to come over to my blog uh, or Probate Investing Simplified, you can get a sample letter over there and you really just need to change them up a little bit. But remember, you're taking them on a journey everything starts with the journey or the story and with probates it's no different remember that you you want them to know that they may not be ready today but they'll be that they'll be ready at some point and when they're ready you will be there uh, to help them you'll be there to buy the property so uh, if you want to find out more about probates i'm going to open up the course actually i'm opening it up this week one last time for this year and then it won't be opened up again uh, until next year sometime it's probateinvestingsimplified.com it's a six-week course dripped down so you've got time to get it all done before the holidays and be perfectly positioned to um, hit the ground running into 2021 so Hugo I think that's that's all I have if you want to take back control of this uh, I'm not really sure how to do that from my end thank you very much Sharon so friends I highly encourage you to take advantage of these deeper insight secrets to probate investing um, simplified with uh, Sharon and what we're gonna do for all of you when you sign up with Sharon is that we're going to give you free access to Chicago Deal Vault for as long as the course lasts with Sharon, okay? So that's our promise to you when you sign up with uh, Sharon. Um, is there a deadline, Sharon, for uh, uh, people to sign up for your course? I did not hear any of what you said. You were gone. Oh, okay. Sorry. So what I was saying is that I highly encourage everyone to sign up with the, with your program for deeper knowledge on private investing. Uh, and what we're going to do for, for you when you sign up with Sharon is we're going to give you free access to Chicago Deal Vault for as long as the course with Sharon lasts. Um, is there a deadline, uh, Sharon, for people to sign up with your course? Uh, I'm going to have it open probably for about 10 days. And then okay. I'm going to close it down till sometime next year. Um, I've, I've had a number of requests to open it up. People say that they have time right now to work on it. I uh, had planned on opening it up right at this particular time. But um, yes, I'm going to open it up for roughly around 10 days, somewhere around that time on Hugo. 10 days. Perfect. So friends, mm -hmm. please take advantage of this because this is the perfect timing. The downtime is the... the 
time for us to take a step back and really dive into probate. Uh, in fact, you know, Andrew Holmes told me uh, the other day, hey, Hugo, listen, if I had to do all over again everything that I've done, I would start with probate. It's one of the most, as Sharon said, um, important lead pipes in real estate. Uh, so please take advantage of it. And, and your presentation was incredible, Sharon. Well, thank uh, you. Th Hugo. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was so, so informative. Um, I always learned something uh, from you. So I really appreciate your time and uh, friends. Uh, thank you for joining tonight. We're, we're going to send you the replay first thing in the morning, and then uh, we can follow up with you should you be interested in uh, signing up with Sharon. And again, we're going to give you free available, free access to Dealbo, uh for the duration of her course. And um, if you still don't have access to Dealbo, please, um, this is your chance to sign up, get a 30-day free trial, and we're gonna uh, feel can you please post the promo code Sharon we're gonna give you a 30-day free trial okay but that is gonna get extended when you sign up with uh, Sharon's program okay but uh, tonight we're gonna give you a 30-day free trial you go, one, thing, one thing I wanted to point out that I didn't mention is this is such a uh, different times today yeah. I'm going to do something a little yeah. bit different that I'm going to have a call couple of calls that are going to be implementation calls because I don't want people to get get through the course and then get into the holidays and then come January they don't um, they you know they need help so um, haven't figured that out exactly because I've never done it exactly this way but I'm going to have a couple of calls to make sure that everybody's on the same page and that helps them with the, to begin the implementation perfect that's huge Sort of like a mastermind uh, personalized phone call, friends. So that that's huge. Um, that's something new that I think it adds tremendous value. Just to make sure that uh, everything that you learn has actionable steps that you can follow uh, to be successful. Uh, so, Hugo, is there an opportunity for me to ask a question, or if you, or do you guys have to go right now? No, I can answer a question. Yes, Hugo, uh, this is for you and then one for Ms. Bernhardt. Uh, first, you, Hugo, uh, I noticed that you, in the Chicago Deal Vault, you have like attorney information, and Ms. Bernhardt has said speak to only the administrator. Which lane, I, I'm going to, she's the expert, of course, so I'm going to follow what she says. She uh, said she didn't say speak to an attorney whatsoever. Well, I think I can clear that up. I, so, it's, whether it's in Chicago or where I live in Louisville, Kentucky, sometimes you don't have a choice but to speak to the attorney. They have made uh, the attorney somehow ends up to be the executor. That is not the best place for you to be from the standpoint of a singular estate. It, anytime you can speak directly with the family, you're going to get better results because the attorneys, they're not really... Um, looking out for you. They don't really care if you get a good deal or you don't get a good deal. So the, from that perspective, you're always going to get uh, better results if you can speak directly to the executor. Now, there is a an argument for mailing directly to probate attorneys. When we pull probates in, in my area, there are probably two or three, four attorneys that do 90% of the probate work in this in my city. So setting up a different, a separate direct mail campaign to the attorneys is a great way to get on their radar. Uh, and then when they have a house it, where they are the executor and it's a distressed property, it's a great way to get them to call you. And I go over that in the course. So it's two really different strategies. But it's kind of like if you can pose this like if you were to talk to a realtor about a house, they're they're really interested in protecting their commission and you know the seller. They're not worried about whether you get a good deal with the with the seller. And it's the same thing with probates. If you can talk directly to the uh, to the personal representative, it's a hundred percent better every time. Oh yeah, and, this, and the second question, thank you for answering that, Ms. Reinhold. Uh, the second question, 
is that uh, I had a friend who start tried to start being a wholesaler early in the year. Uh, and he just threw his hands up because of the pandemic and he went back to work uh, saying that wholesaling is not going to work. But what he did, he gave me leads that he had. Mm-hmm. They were probate leads. They were from a company. I don't think I should say the name, but they're from a company. So, yeah, uh, okay. um, and they have the information on there except for the attorney information. They have the, the, the administrator, the executor. And you said those leads are sometimes not accurate and not good. Well, if you've got the leads and you didn't pay $500 for 50 leads, what have you got to lose? You can you can go on to the tax assessor site and look some of those up. You can probably look them up through Chicago Deal Vault. You, I certainly wouldn't throw those leads away because he probably paid, he or she probably paid good money for those. Yeah, he paid like $1,000. Yeah, them. they're very expensive when they're there when uh, it's not uncommon to pay uh, $500 for 50 leads, $1,000 for 1,000 leads or more. So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't throw those away. Now, what I would do is look on uh, the tax assessor site to see if the house has been sold. You don't want to spend money uh, on direct mail if they're from the beginning of last year. Is that, did I hear you correctly? Uh, no, they are from, uh, he got the lease, they were from, uh, he got them in July of 2019. Oh, July of 2019. You, you, what you need to do is you need to look all of those up because probably they have been closed already. It, you can look them up and see if they've been sold. But remember that, remember when I said that they have to file a federal tax return on the estate and they're kind of under a timeline. I'm not going to say there couldn't be one in there that's not been sold, but it would be unlikely that that, that estate would not be closed because that would be a year and a half. So I would go just go through and there's no shortcut to this is look them up one by one. Okay, thank you for answering that. That's okay. I think uh, anybody else have a question before we go? See, so see a number of people on here. I know. Thanks for coming out. Hey, Sharon. This is Phil. Um, we actually have questions in chat. Are you able okay. to see it? Yeah. Um. Yeah, I didn't. You have questions in chat? Let's see. Yeah. I don't see, um, I see questions for Hugo. Oh, there's one, what is the website to sign up? Is that, is that, is that a question for Hugo? Oh, for me, um, that would be probateinvestingsimplified.com. I'll put it in the chat. So you can look on the, it's like on the screen here, probateinvestingsimplified.com. Um, and then the blog was Louisville Gals Real Estate Blog, if you wanted to check the blog out. Oh, I see. Danny, Bill's got it there. Okay. I don't, see, I don't see any other questions, Phil. Do you see something that I don't see? Hugo, are you still here? Phil, are you okay. still here? Yes, I'm still here. Um, oh, we have a okay. question, question okay. from Rosa. I, I'm not sure if this is for you. Uh, what are your thoughts on the type of mail, handwritten notes, template letters, postcards, what works best? Yes, I know exactly what works best, and it's not postcards. You shouldn't send postcards uh, about when you're speaking about somebody that's passed away. And uh, yellow, the, the handwritten letters, don't don't use those. You want to use a white computer-generated letter that's mail merged that says, "Dear Mr. Johnson, I'm contacting you about the property at," and then has the address in there. The results are so much better using that. They need to have the confidence that you're a real company 
and this is not a time when you um, you gain their confidence um, if you if you've written out a, a letter it, it is of no advantage and you can't scale that so I, my advice is don't do that thank you Sharon hey you go are you still here you go um Dassey, danny is asking a question when is the program going to start it uh, danny it's uh you 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 get the access to the first module as soon as you sign up it's dripped down over six weeks that's so that you learn each piece as you go along and uh then the the direct mail there's a bonus direct mail module where i teach you how to do direct mail the correct way and you get uh two sets of letters you get a set of letters for um, for investors, and you get a set of letters specifically if you are a realtor. So both of these are very viable. Uh, it's for both groups of people. So you get the direct, you get all of the letters, and then you get the uh, the bonus. Uh, you know, Danny, you're a realtor. Okay, Danny. So you can come at this. I don't know if you are an investor or a an investor realtor or just a realtor. So the way you would use the letters, if you're an investor, the way I, I think people have the best results is to go at it from an investor. And then uh, if you don't, if you're not able to put a deal together, then you can say, well, we can try and list your house. If you go at it from uh i'm trying to get their business from uh as a realtor and then you try to switch over to buying it for cash but you know making them a cash offer that often doesn't work out so well but i do it i i go over all of that in the course because there there are some people that are very successfully doing both they show up as a as a cash buyer and if they're not uh, if they can't give them an offer that works for them then they will offer to list the property so uh, i think i think that answers your question if it doesn't let me know uh do i recommend never calling no i recommend that you do not cold call probates you need to remember i like to tell people somebody's mama died and they don't want you to call them they get and from years of doing this they get very angry when you call them Cold calling is not the way to do this. You have to do direct mail. Um, they, uh, Michael, all the information about the course is over there on, on their uh, probate investing simplified. And I would point out too that we have a private Facebook group so that you can always uh, get your questions answered in the group. You're never left out in the cold where this is concerned to fend for yourself. So we have a private Facebook group. Um, I'm checking in there every day to see if anybody has questions. And then we're going to have these calls because of the way it's going to fall over the holidays. We're going to have some calls, you know, where we get questions answered and do some implementation. Phil, I don't see any other questions. Do you? I believe Michael has a question on the course coast cost about. oh yeah it's is 1997 all the information is over there on the on the probate investing simplified.com site you know you're not only going to get a course that's going to teach you how to do probate you're going to get all the marketing materials that you need and you're going to learn how to do direct mail which is a bonus that you can use in any niche in real estate so any of the the leads, the list that come out of Chicago Deal Vault, you can use the same information, the same procedures. Direct mail works great for off-market deals. Um, whether you're doing out-of-state absentee owners, probates, it really doesn't matter. They works great. Thank you so much, Sharon. Um, Hugo, are you still here? I believe um, Hugo is not uh, anymore with okay. us. So okay. I'd like to thank you so much, Sharon, for sharing your um, presentation today. I myself have learned a lot as well. Um, for those who 
who, who are able to sign up or to sign up with Sharon, please let us know so that we can make adjustments with your subscription and we'll be able to help you. Also, if you need uh, assistance with reaching out to Sharon, you can reach out to us so that we can connect you with Sharon. Thank you so much, Sharon. Thank you everyone for joining tonight. And um, yeah, we have a great night, everyone. Thank you.